The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Chapter 5 About half past ten the cracked bell of the small church began to ring, and presently the people began to gather for the morning sermon. The Sunday school children distributed themselves about the house and occupied pews with their parents, so as to be under supervision. Aunt Polly came, and Tom and Sid and Mary sat with her, Tom being placed next the aisle in order that he might be as far away from the open window and the seductive outside summer scenes as possible. The crowd filed up the aisles, the aged and needy postmaster who had seen better days, the mayor and his wife, for they had a mayor there, among other unnecessaries, the justice of the peace, the widow Douglas, fair, smart, and forty, a generous, good-hearted soul, and well-to-do, her human mansion the only palace in the town and the most hospitable and much the most lavish in the manner of festivities that St. Petersburg could boast, the bent and venerable Major and Mrs. Ward, Lawyer Riverson, the new notable from a distance, next the bell of the village, followed by a troop of lawn-clad and ribbon-decked young heartbreakers, then all the young clerks in town in the body, for they had stood in the vestibule sucking their cane heads, a circling wall of oiled and simpering admirers, till the last girl had run their gauntlet, and last of all came the model boy, William Mufferson, taking as heedful care of his mother as if she were cut glass. He always brought his mother to church, and was the pride of all the matrons. The boys all hated him, he was so good, and besides he had been thrown up to them so much. His white handkerchief was hanging out of his pocket behind, as usual on Sundays, accidentally. Tom had no handkerchief, and he looked upon boys who had as snobs. The congregation being fully assembled, now the bell rang once again to warn laggards and stragglers, and then a solemn hush fell upon the church which was only broken by the tittering and whispering of the choir in the gallery. The choir always tittered and whispered all through service. There was once a church choir that was not ill-bred, but I have forgotten where it was now. It was a great many years ago, and I can scarcely remember anything about it, but I think it was in some foreign country. The minister gave out the hymn and read it through with a relish, in a peculiar style which was much admired in that part of the country. His voice began on a medium key and climbed steadily up till it reached a certain point where it bore with strong emphasis upon the topmost word and then plunged down as if from a springboard. Shall I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, whilst others fight to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? He was regarded as a wonderful reader. At church sociables he was always called upon to read poetry. And when he was through, the ladies would lift up their hands and let them fall helplessly in their laps and wall their eyes and shake their heads as much as to say, words cannot express it. It is too beautiful, too beautiful for this mortal earth. After the hymn had been sung, the Reverend Mr. Sprague turned himself into a bulletin board and read off notices of meetings and societies and things till it seemed that the list would stretch out to the crack of doom. A queer custom, which is still kept up in America, even in cities, away here in this age of abundant newspapers. Often, the less there is to justify a traditional custom, the harder it is to get rid of it. And now the minister prayed. A good, generous prayer it was, and went into details. It pleaded for the church, and the little children of the church, for the other churches of the village, for the village itself, for the county, for the state, for the state officers, for the United States, for the Churches of the United States, for Congress, for the President, for the officers of the government, for poor sailors tossed by stormy seas, for the oppressed millions groaning under the heel of European monarchies and Oriental despotisms. For such as have the light and the good tidings, and yet have not eyes to see nor ears to hear withal, for the heathen in the far islands of the sea, and closed with his application that the words he was about to speak might find grace and favor, and be a seed sown in fertile ground, yielding in time a grateful harvest of good. Amen. There was a rustling of dresses, and the standing congregation sat down. The boy whose history this book relates did not enjoy the prayer. He only endured it, if he even did that much. He was dressed of all through it. He kept tally of the details of the prayer, unconsciously. 
for he was not listening, but he knew the ground of old and the clergyman's regular route over it. And when a little trifle of new matter was interlarded, his ear detected it and his whole nature resented it. He considered editions unfair and scoundrelly. In the midst of the prayer, a fly had lit on the back of the pew in front of him and tortured his spirit by calmly rubbing its hands together, embracing its head with its arms and polishing it so vigorously that it seemed to almost part company with the body, and the slender thread of a neck was exposed to view, scraping its wings with its hind legs and smoothing them to its body as if they had been coat tails, going through its whole toilet as tranquilly as if it knew it was perfectly safe as indeed it was, for as sorely as Tom's hands itched to grab for it, they did not dare. He believed his soul would be instantly destroyed if he did such a thing while the prayer was going on. But with the closing sentence his hand began to curve and steal forward, and the instant the Amen was out, the fly was a prisoner of war. His aunt detected the act and made him let it go. The minister gave out his text and droned along monotonously through an argument that was so prosy that many a head by and by began to nod. And yet it was an argument that dealt in limitless fire and brimstone, and thinned the predestined elect down to a company so small as to be hardly worth the saving. Tom counted the pages of the sermon. After church he always knew how many pages there had been, but he seldom knew anything else about the discourse. However, this time he was really interested for a little while. The minister made a grand and moving picture of the assembling together of the world's hosts at the millennium when the lion and the lamb should lie down together and a little child should lead them. But the pathos, the lesson, the moral of the great spectacle were lost upon the boy. He only thought of the conspicuousness of the principal character before the onlooking nations. His face lit with the thought and he said to himself that he wished he could be that child, if it was a tame lion. Now he lapsed into suffering again, as the dry argument was resumed. Presently he bethought him of a treasure he had and got it out. It was a large black beetle with formidable jaws, a pinch bug, he called it. It was in a percussion cap box. The first thing the beetle did was to take him by the finger. A natural Philip followed, the beetle went floundering into the aisle and lit on its back, and the hurt finger went into the boy's mouth. The beetle lay there working its helpless legs, unable to turn over. Tom eyed it and longed for it, but it was safe out of his reach. Other people uninterested in the sermon found relief in the beetle, and they eyed it too. Presently, a vagrant poodle dog came idling along, sad at heart, lazy with the summer softness and the quiet, weary of captivity, sighing for change. He spied the beetle. The drooping tail lifted and wagged. He surveyed the prize, walked around it, smelt at it from a safe distance, walked around it again, grew bolder and took a closer smell, then lifted his lip and made a gingerly snatch at it, just missing it, made another and another, began to enjoy the diversion, subsided to his stomach with the beetle between his paws and continued his experiments, grew weary at last and then indifferent and absent-minded. His head nodded, and little by little his chin descended and touched the enemy, who seized it. There was a sharp yelp, a flirt of the poodle's head, and the beetle fell a couple of yards away, and lit on its back once more. The neighboring spectators shook with a gentle inward joy. Several faces went behind fans and handkerchiefs, and Tom was entirely happy. The dog looked foolish, and probably felt so, but there was resentment in his heart, too, and a craving for revenge. So he went to the beetle and began a wary attack on it again, jumping at it from every point of a circle, lighting with his four paws within an inch of the creature, making even closer snatches at it with his teeth, and jerking his head till his ears flapped again. But he grew tired once more, after a while, tried to amuse himself with the fly but found no relief, followed an ant around, with his nose close to the floor, and quickly wearied of that yawned, sighed, forgot the beetle entirely, and sat down on it. Then there was a wild yelp of agony, and the poodle went sailing up the aisle. The yelps continued, and so did the dog. He crossed the house in front of the altar, he flew down the other aisle, he crossed before the doors, he clambered up the home stretch. his anguish grew with his progress, till presently he was but a woolly comet moving in its orbit with the gleam and the speed of light.
At last the frantic sufferer sheared from its course and sprang into its master's lap. He flung it out of the window, and the voice of distress quickly thinned away and died in the distance. By this time the whole church was red-faced and suffocating with suppressed laughter, and the sermon had come to a dead standstill. The discourse was resumed presently, but it went lame and halting, all possibility of impressiveness being at an end, for even the gravest sentiments were constantly being received with a smothered burst of unholy mirth, under cover of some remote pew-back, as if the poor parson had said a rarely facetious thing. It was a genuine relief to the whole congregation when the ordeal was over and the benediction pronounced. Tom Sawyer went home quite cheerful, thinking to himself that there was some satisfaction about divine service when there was a bit of variety in it. He had but one marring thought. He was willing that a dog should play with his pinch bug, but he did not think it was upright in him to carry it off. After the hymn had been sung, the Reverend Mr. Sprague turned himself into a bulletin board and read off notices of meetings and societies and things till it seemed that the list would stretch out to the crack of doom. A queer custom which is still kept up in America, even in cities, away here in this age of abundant newspapers. Twain takes pleasure in pointing out some of the more peculiar institutions that have become part of American life. This particular practice, Twain would be pleased to know, continues to this day. The minister gave out his text and droned along monotonously through an argument that was so prosy that many a head by and by began to nod. And yet it was an argument that dealt in limitless fire and brimstone, and thinned the predestined elect down to a company so small as to be hardly worth the saving. Despite the evident fervor of people like Aunt Polly and the minister himself, the people of St. Petersburg cannot help but nod off. And now the minister prayed. A good, generous prayer it was, and went into details. It pleaded for the church, and the little children of the church, for the other churches of the village, for the village itself, for the county, for the state, for the state officers, for the United States, for the churches of the United States, for Congress, for the President, for the officers of the government, for poor sailors tossed by stormy seas, for the oppressed millions groaning under the heel of European monarchies and Oriental despotisms, for such as have the light and the good tidings, and yet have not eyes to see nor ears to hear withal for the heathen in the far islands of the sea, and closed with a supplication that the words he was about to speak might find grace and favor, and be a seed sown in fertile ground, yielding in time a grateful harvest of good. Amen. The Christianity practiced at Tom's church seems heavily, almost overwhelmingly, America-centric. The first idea that Twain establishes in Chapter 5 is the centrality of the church to the town of St. Petersburg. Sunday is the sacred day for all of St. Petersburg. Sunday is the day when the entire village goes to church to convene as a community of shared values. On Sunday morning, all of the town's respected inhabitants attend the church. It is as much a social function as it is a religious one. The town of St. Petersburg is small, poor, and quiet. The church, with its cracked church bell that resounds through the town, becomes a quintessential symbol of small town life. Ironically, it is this quality of small town life and the centrality of the church that Twain satirizes throughout the novel. In their gathering, Twain spotlights the stereotypical characters that make up small town America. Even though Tom isn't interested in learning the Bible, he still believes in the worst stories he has heard of hell. When Tom yearns to catch the fly, but doesn't dare to, for fear that interrupting the prayers will damn him, his sense of self-importance is heightened as he fears that he will become the greatest sinner even for a minor sin. Reverend sermonizes about the apocalypse. Tom wishes he could be its hero, braving limitless fire and brimstone. Any moral lessons are lost on him, however. To Tom, even hell is a more exciting and enviable place than his present situation. He likes the dramatic imagery of the Bible but doesn't thoughtfully pursue its moral lessons, like most religious folk. 
Tom's desire to be the child leading the lion and the lamb, while misguided, demonstrates that he is at least listening to some of the sermon. Tom can only remain well behaved for so long. Soon, he decides to pull out one of his treasures, a large black beetle that he keeps in a box. The results of his mischief prove that the same could be true of adults as well. In their shared light at the antics of the beetle and the dog, a sense of community is created amongst all of the villagers, ironically fulfilling their expectations of a church service. Tom's chief joy is avoiding the routine and he feels a huge sense of accomplishment after having shaken up the predictable course of the Sunday church service. Even so, he'll always be left wanting something outside of his grasp. This insatiable appetite goes hand in hand with his youthful desire to avoid the routine. Tom isn't a bad kid, just ordinary, and Twain writes about Tom with such a fondness that you can't help but be endeared to the young Sawyer. The episode of the beetle and the poodle is presented so humorously that it's easy to imagine yourself alongside with Tom laughing with him. As Twain describes the church service in chapter 5, he again shows Tom's faults replicated in the behavior of adults. Tom is restless and inattentive in the usual childlike manner, but he is not alone. The whole congregation drifts towards slumber and many a head by and by began to nod. By releasing the pinch book and creating havoc, Tom succeeds in doing what the sermon cannot. He gets the congregation's attention. With more people caring about the pinch bug than the minister's fire and brimstone, the church service begins to seem as ridiculous as the struggle between the poodle and the insect. Again, however, Twain's satire is not cruel. Nobody is accused of being irreligious or wicked for falling asleep during the church service. Rather, Twain exposes the comic and sometimes ridiculous elements of traditions, such as church going, that bind the community together. The minister is described as unnecessarily long winded. The subject of his sermon is never given any importance. Instead, Twain focuses on his speech and his mannerisms, describing his sentences as a plunge down from the springboard. Even the prayer seems to drag on forever, with the minister sending out his prayers to anyone and everyone. Even the sociables are unable to stay attuned to the minister during his monotonous speech. The antics between Tom, the dog, and the beetle provide comic relief to the church. What is most important, however, is the fact that the attendees pay more attention to the antics of the pinch bug than they do to the speech given from the pulpit. When the church is suffering from suppressed laughter, Twain describes it as unholy mirth. This dichotomy between the serious and the playful, the moral and the mischievous, parallels Tom's constant struggle between his need for adventure and his desire to be good.